It's June 13th, 2017. We're speaking with survivor Stanley Bernath, B-E-R-N-A-T-H, interviewer Faye Shalaton, S-H-O-L-I-T-O-N. We're in Lyndhurst, Ohio, USA, and we'll be speaking English. It's June 13th, 2017. We're speaking with survivor Stanley Bernath, B-E-R-N-A-T-H, and interviewer is Faye, F-A-Y-E, Charlatan, S-H-O-L-I-T-O-N. We're in Lyndhurst, Ohio, USA, and we will be recording in English. We're interviewing survivor Stanley Bernath today in Lyndhurst, Ohio. June 13th, 2017. Please state your name and the spelling of your name. Stanley Burnett, B as in boy, E-R-N-A-T-H. What was your name at birth? Z like zebra, O-L-I, Burnett. And that was that your full name? Yes. And uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Carre, C-A-R-A-I, Romania, 1926, March 28th. And uh, locate that for the map. What, what was the nearest city? The nearest city was Oradea, just in Transylvania. And at that time, part of what country? When I was born, it was Romania. Okay. What's your age today? 91. You said your last name is Bernath. Tell me, please, the origin of that name. I don't know. We try to look it up. It's probably Hungarian. And there's, when you said your name at birth, it was B-E-R-N-A... T. T. Without the H. And the H came from where? Don't know. Later in the years, I don't know where that came from. Okay. Um, what language was spoken in your home? Hungarian. Anything else? Yeah, in school, Romanian. Was Yiddish ever a part of your home? Yes, not at home. Yiddish was uh, in school, besides German, French, Latin. And by what name were you called at home? Did you have any nicknames? No, Zoli, Z-O-L-I. Okay. Um, tell me about your father, starting with his name. His name was Martin. Same last name, Bernath. Mm -hmm. Do you know what his birth date or birth year was? Uh, 1996, I believe. Again, no, I'm sorry, 1896. Okay. Sorry. And did he have a Hebrew name? Yes. Mordechai. Mm -hmm. And do you know where, what town he was born in? He was born somewhere in Hungary. Okay. Um, did, do you know what he did for a living? Yes. He worked for the railroad. Any further description about what he did for the railroad? Well, he started out... On a very low grade, then he went up. He became a manager of a, of a part of a, the train that delivered um, packages. Okay. Um, did he ever serve in the military? Yes, he has. He served in the German army during the First World War. German or Hungarian? Hungarian or, army. No, Hungarian, okay. Um, why did he ultimately leave Hungary for Romania? Because if he was a Hungarian, what, what was there for him in Romania? When he was discharged from the army, that's what I heard from him. He wanted to become a citizen of, Hung Hung of Hungary, but they refused because he was a Jew. He didn't like that, so he moved to Romania. Did he have other stories of anti-Semitism in Hungary? Not that I know of. I was only 11 years old when he passed away. Okay.
Okay, we'll talk about that. Uh, from what you remember, describe his work ethic. He was a hard worker and he loved his job because of pension. And that's what he was looking for. And uh, he had a very, very uh, big job. He worked five, six days a week traveling on trains. He liked his work. And tell me about his um, religion. How, what part did religion play in his life? Well, we were uh, not very religious at home, but uh, we went to, sh to temple, high holidays, and we kept kosher at home. That's I, significant, yes. Yeah, I remember that. That was kosher. Uh, was it difficult being kosher in Romania, or there were there were enough resources? When I was a kid, I, I didn't know of any. No. Okay. Uh, his role in the family. What kind of father was he? He was one of my. He was my hero. He was a great father. As little time he had, he uh, treated me well and. Uh, he was a great parent. Mm -hmm. Did he have any affiliations in the community, with the synagogue, in any political movements, anything like that? No, not that I know of, no. Okay. And now let's talk about your mother, starting with her name. Yeah, my mother's name was Louisa, and uh, her maiden name was Weiss. Louisa Weiss. And do you know her birth year? Ninety or eighteen ninety nine. Okay. Um, talk about her as a mother. Tell tell us what she did. As far as I remember, she was a good mother. She took care of the house together with my grandmother. They they were nice people. They were very nice to me, as a parent. But don't forget, I was a, a little boy. Did you have siblings? Yes. I had a, a Charlie, the one that I remember. What was Charlie's birth name? Caroli. K-A-R-O-L-Y. Caroli. He changed the name when he came to the United States. Then I had a brother that passed away when I was two years old, Le Leslie. Was that his... Leslie? Leslie, right. Could you spell that, please? Well, actually, the spelling, his name was Lutzi. L-A-C-I. Lutzi. Okay. And the birth years of your brother, Charlie was born approximately when? Charlie was born in 1917, and my brother had passed away. Lutzi was born in 1919. Okay, thank you. Um, it was, you mentioned a grandmother. Was there anyone else who was actually part of your household growing up? Uh, Esther, my grandmother. Her last house. name was? Esther. Esther, her last name? Weiss. Okay. And spell Weiss. I don't think we got that down. W-E-I-S. Single S. Yeah. Weiss. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about her, I hope. Uh, tell me what you were like as a child. Well, we had a clean living, uh, not in poverty. I went to school and uh, my parents and my grandmother treated me well. The only thing my grandmother wanted every time that I came home from school, she asked me what uh, I brought her. She called herself a little squirrel. What did you bring me? So I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't bring anything. I didn't have any money. She reached in my pocket, of course, and she got a piece of candy. I remember that. So every time I see a squirrel in my backyard, it reminds me of that. 
and tell me what you were like uh, socially. Did you have a large circle of friends? No, I just had one friend, George, who had one leg. I was his best friend in school. I met him in school. And after school, I went to his house and we spent a lot of time together. He was a good guy. And after the war, I don't know where he was during the war, but after the war, he became a doctor. Oh, he did survive the war. Yes, he survived. I don't know how. He, he was not in a camp or anywhere. Wow. And um, he passed away uh, about 10 years ago. We'll follow through with that later, too. Okay. Um, did you have any political thoughts during those years? Were you aware no. of what was going on in the world? No, nothing at all. Uh, my brother belonged to a Zionist organization. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they called him a Zionist. But I didn't know what was going on in the world. No newspaper or anything, so we didn't know what was going on. And how about your religious observance? Well, I just ate what they fed me at home <laughs> yeah. and went to temple when my father decided to go to temple on high holidays. And that's all I can remember. Did you have a bar mitzvah? Oh yes, after uh, my father passed away, and a lot of people at my bar mitzvah, 12. 12 people? Yes. That included, because I would like to know about your, your expanded family. Would that be no. an event that would get people together? No, there was no family member there. Just the people from the uh, uh, temple. That's all I can remember. My bar mitzvah. Is this because your extended family lived in another place? Yes. They were still back in Hungary? Uh, some places in Romania, some places in Hungary. But not Hungary, as much as I can remember in Romania. Mm -hmm. What kind of event would get everyone together? Sorry, would you repeat that? Please? What type of event would have brought everyone together? I don't remember of any event. A birthday or New Year's, I can't remember anything. Um, tell me about the schools that you attended. I went to a Jewish school, which was great, cost a lot of money. I understood, I don't know how much. But my, my father passed away in 1937 in the train accident. My mother had a problem paying the dues at the school. So at the fifth grade, she sent me to a public school. And there was a problem. Because by that time, the Hungarians occupied that part of Romania. They called me a dirty Jew, and they, more or less, they kicked me out. So I went back to the... Uh, Hebrew school. I don't know where my mother got the money. I went back to Hebrew school and I stayed there until the eighth grade. I graduated from the eighth grade and that's all the money she had. Then I had to do something else. I was an apprentice, an electrician apprentice for a year and a half. I became a licensed electrician and I did my job. Helped my mother to survive. And did your brother contribute also? No, because he was married, he had his own problems. Was he nearby? Oh yeah, he was been nearby. Charlie was nearby. But uh, he had a little girl, and he had to take care of his own family. Were there other ways to earn money? Uh, yes. There were other ways. While well, he worked part-time at the factory, uh, steel factory, 
and they also uh, manufactured some items that I took home and uh, my mother and grandmother we put and get together like uh, sockets and we made some money there. So you did factory piecework, is that yes. what it was? Yeah, we uh, had it together and then we finished with it. My, my grandmother and I, we took it back to the factory. Um, how important to, especially now that your mother was widowed, how important was the synagogue to your family life? I don't think that was uh, very important, the synagogue, really. Do you remember the name of the synagogue? Yeah, Zion Temple, Temple Zion. Yeah. And was there any leader there, or anyone that you remember? Yes. Some people remember Hebrew yes, school teachers. They, uh, yeah, I had a Hebrew teacher, of course. But the rabbi was a fantastic man, as I can remember, a Dr. Keshkemate, K-E-C-S, K-E-T-E, Keshkemate. And he passed away. Yeah. I remember that. But we were not very involved in the synagogue. Um, did you have any hopes or dreams as a young boy, what you wanted to be, what you wanted to do? Not really. But I remember one time I was dreaming about I wanted to be a doctor. But that dream <laughs> went away when I had to leave school. I had no choice. My mother didn't have the money to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And that cost quite a bit of money. So what were the opportunities open to a Jewish student whose formal education ended in, you said, the eighth, eighth, eighth grade. grade? Yeah. And that wasn't a hell of a lot because uh, when the Hungarians occupied that part of Transylvania in 1940, we couldn't go to a public school and we didn't have the money uh, for the uh, Hebrew school. So I had no choice but learn a trade, which was fine. I liked it. I made some money and uh, helped us to survive, my mother and grandmother. Um, how well did Jews from Aradia communicate with other Jews, and even in northern Transylvania? What were your ways of finding out what the news was or what their experiences were? I don't remember of any news, world news, anywhere. The only uh, connection I had is with my aunt that lived in near Bucharest, Romania. Her husband was an engineer for the railroad and I spent every summer there with her, every summer. They were very rich people and had a good time there. And my other grandmother from my father's side was with her. So, so I spent a good summer alone, no place, nothing, no friends or anything. But it was great. So you did spend that time in Bucharest? Near Bucharest. Near Bucharest. Yeah. Right now, Bukovina right now is a Ukraine, that part of Romania, Bukovina. Mm -hmm. But uh, I spent uh, summers there, which was great. Again, but I was alone. I remember uh, spending time myself uh, going in the uh, forest. I never forget, I was touching some flowers and all of a sudden uh, oh, I touched, oh, something, oh, my God. It was, I don't even know what it was. But it moved. I was so scared. But well, I was only uh, 12 years old. But I had a good time there, but all by myself. Mm -hmm. So when Aradia became part of uh, Hungary, right. you said there were overt moments of anti-Semitism, name-calling, what else did you experience? Well, there were some restrictions. Uh, stores, I heard, because I was not involved. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, I heard there were restrictions. Everything changed. 
and a lot of the Hungarians that lived there, <coughs> they, they called us names, the Jews. Can I cough? Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. It wasn't uh, very good, but we didn't, you know, as a kid, I didn't put it together to see what it was. I just accepted the fact that Hungarians took over and it was not the same. Like in school, uh, public school, they called him a dirty Jew, the Jew boy. Was that a pleasant thing to uh, hear? No, it wasn't. Did the, your town go by a different name then once it became Hungarian? Yes. The name, the Hungarian name was, which they claim it was going back a thousand years, N-A-G-Y-V-A-R-A-D, Nagyvárad. That was the original name going back a thousand years. And to clarify, you were age 14 when that happened? Yeah, 1940. Yes. Yeah, 1940. Okay. And do you have any specific memories of the transition to Hungarian rule? Well, number one, once or twice a week we had to uh, perform labor, which... Uh, or 14 year olds, 14 to 18 year olds, which uh, was a terrible thing for us. We had to go behind the uh, cemetery, there was an empty land, we digging some dirt up and we carried it a few hundred feet away, dumped it. Next time we went back, we took the same dirt and put it back. They did that to us not to do anything specific, but just to keep us working. It was not a pleasant thing. But we had about 25 to 40 kids my age. As a matter of fact, one of the guys that I was with, he just passed away a year and a half ago here in Cleveland. I visited him every day. He was very sick. He was two years older and I always pretended that I was his age because I want to work with his group. Yeah, he was here. What was the impact on a 14-year-old having to do that? You know what? I accepted it. I, I didn't... You know, when I think back, I accepted everything the way it was. Until my... Uh, 19... Uh, 44. Until then, I accepted everything the way it was. I didn't ask any questions. Were you aware of any new restrictions on travel and ownership uh, of business? I heard things? about it, but I was not aware personally. I was a kid that we didn't have no newspapers, so we didn't know anything about the world, what was going on. We didn't know anything about the Second World War. Uh, except for one time, there some. They told me there were some refugees from Poland. Two young men. And uh, I didn't ask any questions. Why from Poland? I didn't know anything about a war, with Germany taking over the world, or Europe rather. We didn't know anything about it until they occupied Oradia. Mm -hmm. Was there a point at which you had to wear a yellow badge? Yes, when the Germans came in, I had to wear a yellow badge. Yes. Again, did I question why? Because I was a Jew. And I accepted that fact that ever since I was a kid, uh, non-Jewish kids called us uh, Jew boy. I remember that, in Hungarian, of course. But again, I accepted the fact that this is the way things are. I mean, when I think back, it's hard to believe that I didn't ask any questions. What and why and how? No. Yeah. When did the war begin for you in a personal way? 
when the Germans occupied that part of the country. And that year again? I'm sorry, 1944. And this is when uh, everything changed. With a yellow band, uh, a yellow star, uh, stores were closed, no movies, you couldn't do anything as a Jew. This when I first realized that everything changed in the world. Then we heard stories by that time about the Germans. But again, we were not informed as to what was going on. My brother, the Hungarians, <coughs> excuse me, in 1941, they put them in a labor camp. They sent them to Ukraine. He was there for four years. It was awful. I knew about that. Because he was nine years older than I was. But that was an easy thing. For four years he worked there. But again, we didn't ask so many questions until the Germans came in and we heard rumors that the rich Jews were taken to a place called the Drecher uh, factory and they were treated, mistreated to the point where they died, interrogated for money. While we they were still in their hometown? Yeah, we heard about that until when we got into the ghetto, this one we heard about it. So when we got into the ghetto... And when did that happen? I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, the ghetto was in April 1944. And the ghetto... What How did happened? they manage to get everybody into the ghetto? Well, I lived in a small house with my mother. No, knock on the door 8 o'clock in the morning. Two policemen in civilian clothes said, come on out, assemble outside, you got 15 minutes, bring anything or whatever you want with you. Don't ask any questions. We kept our mouths shut. My mother asked me, well, what, what, what's going on? Don't know, huh? In 15 minutes we went out, we had to assemble a bunch of other people. We had uh, 35,000 Jews in a small town, or 95,000 non-Jews, or 95 total. We assembled on the street and we were marched to a place, we never heard the word ghetto. About two miles, two and a half miles, we had to walk to a restricted area. We never heard about it. Yeah, we were taken into the temple, the Orthodox temple. I don't know, about 3,000 people in the temple. The only place we had to uh, sleep on the floor. No food. Water we had, but no food. Questions were asked by that time. Nobody had the answer. The Hungarian guards, not one word. They wouldn't tell us anything. And we were in a ghetto... Uh, for uh, maybe a week or two, then they said, okay, you're going to move in with a family. And my wife knew one of the families, and we moved in there. Five families in a small house. Again, we were sleeping on the floor. All young people, including myself, we were sent to work every day in a forest. What were you doing? Cutting trees. A horrible job, and that was very close to the Romanian border. So every day when I went home, my mother says, Son, why don't you walk over to the Romanian border where you don't have the uh, Germans? He says, No, I, can't leave you. I cannot leave you here by yourself. 
So we put up with it. We didn't have any bread. They had to stand in line for bread. But again, we survived. Until the time came and uh, they lined us up again outside. Well, let's back up just a moment. Okay, go ahead. Um, you talked about the, the fantasy of escaping. Did people try to escape from the ghetto? No. Oh, I, not that I know of. Uh -huh. Not from the ghetto. The one that I could have escaped from when I was in a forest. The border was, the Romanian border was 100 feet away. Mm -hmm. I could have just walked over. But uh, maybe people were risky, but I don't know, because there were about 30, 35,000 people. How the heck would I know if somebody escaped? But as far as I can look back what I heard, nobody escaped. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for clarification, sure. at the time that you were taken to the ghetto, there were only two of you living at your home, you and your mother. That's correct. Uh, what happened to your grandmother? Oh, my grandmother passed away two years before. Thank God. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to suffer. She was 73 years old. Uh, when you were in the ghetto, uh, what were you told was going to happen to the Jews of your town? Okay. Any questions we ask, nobody had the answer. And we asked the gendarmes, what they called the Hungarian police. They said, don't ask any questions. By that time, we were 25% brain dead. We didn't know what was going on. We left our house, your home, and we hear with strangers, what were we doing here? Nobody had the answer. We couldn't ask anybody. I remember that exactly because I was already a teenager. But again, we couldn't do anything about it. We had to put up with it. What did they do to keep order? Because there must have been some sense of fighting back? Well, probably I heard after the war that some people tried to escape, yes. And some of them were shot or killed. But I didn't hear about it before. So well, while you were still in the ghetto, you didn't witness I didn't any hear atrocities? I did nothing. Uh -huh. But I could have escaped by crossing the border, but I didn't want to leave my mother. Yeah. And when you left your home, and this was a rush exit from your home, right. what did you take with you? A few pieces of clothes, some food, that's all. And right. did you have any idea what became of your home and your possessions? Yes. When I, well, I was going to wait until I tell you when I uh, was liberated and I went back. Oh, that's fine. I, I just okay. wanted to know whether you could have time to even make provisions for that? No, no time for, for anything. We just left. Mm -hmm. By that time, like I said, it was 25% brain dead. We didn't know what was going on. Nobody right. had the answer. Anybody ask a question? Nobody knew the answer. Yeah. Well, before I backtracked, you were starting to tell me that um, things were about to change drastically. At what point did you, was it really clear that everybody was going to be leaving the ghetto? Well, we heard some rumors that we'd be relocated to a better place. That was, this is what I remember. We heard a much better place than where we were at now. Some people were talking about it, we were talking about it. Oh, we're going to a better place. Some people ask where. And I remember the name of the town they said in, oh, Kosice, in uh, near Prague, Czechoslovakia at the time. Oh, you're going to be relocated there. So I heard them talk about it. My parents, my mother, and the people there where we stayed. Oh, we're going to be relocated. But again, nobody had the answer. What's with my house or where we live and our possessions? Nothing. Mm -hmm. How long were you in the ghetto altogether? Three weeks, end of uh, April. 
Again, we're lined up outside. Where are we going? Don't ask any questions. We were marched not very far away was a park and there was a railroad track right by the park. We were marched there and where we saw a train. It was an unbelievable sight because we seen these trains carrying animals. So we didn't know what was going on until the doors opened and the guards said, get inside. Some of the people, elderly people, couldn't go in. We had to help them, children. We had to help them get inside this horrible place. Anywhere between 70 and 75 people jammed up. I remember it, and my mother wasn't even with me. She was in a different, and same train, but not the same, same place. I don't know how that happened. The only time I uh, saw her is in Auschwitz. But again, we got in, questions, nobody had the answer. All we had room for is to sit down. <clears throat> Food? No. Water? One bucket of water. Next to it, another bucket for toilet. Except for one thing, nobody could move. Once you sat down, that's where you were at. Oh, but we're going to uh, Czechoslovakia to uh, relocate it. They closed the doors, and they had a little window that you couldn't even get up to look out. First day we traveled, the, the uh, train stopped. Oh, we're here. No, you're not. Where are we going now? Oh, to a better place. That's what we were told. But by that time, we were totally messed up. We traveled two more days until we arrived to a place called Auschwitz. We never heard of it before in Poland. You know, all my life as a kid, I heard the expression hell. I didn't know what, what hell meant until they opened the doors. This most horrible sight I have ever seen. Dogs barking, shootings. They were like four, three, four o'clock in the morning spotlights on, people screaming, children taken away from the, from the mothers. I had my niece, five-year-old. They grabbed her from my, uh, my sister-in-law, and one hour later probably she was dead. But everybody was screaming. They didn't want to let the children go. It went on not for very long, a couple of hours. We're standing there. Some people were moved to the left side, some to the right side. We didn't know what it was. We had no idea. By that time, we were 100% brain dead. Nobody even asked any questions. The smell was unbearable. The sky was black. We didn't know what it was. They took a few of us to a barrack. I don't remember what number barrack. They took our clothes, shaved our heads, gave us a striped uniform, and I was assigned a new name. And I was told from now on, you don't use your name. My name was 70,000. 465. Now, if I would have stayed in Auschwitz more than six days, they would have tattooed the number on my arm. 
but I stayed alone for six days. After we went through with the clothes and shaving the heads, some people asked, when are we going to see our, our family? When are we going to reunite with our family? The God said in about two hours. So, but he waited two hours later. The God says, come outside to see your family. That was the most unbelievable sight. The sky was black, ashes falling down. I never seen anything like it. He said, meet your family. You know, when I think about it, we were totally brain dead. We didn't know what the heck was going on. We couldn't think. Some people had five, six children, mothers, grandmothers. Here they were, ashes. It's an unbelievable sight. That I never forget. So I was there for six days. Now they had two kinds of camp, two camps. One is a death camp, where they kill you immediately. And what is a work camp? I didn't know what happened to my mother. I had no idea. She was about 50 years old. Well, it looked like I was in a, going into a labor camp. Six days later, they marched us, put us on a train again, and we went to a place called the Mauthausen in Austria. It was uh, maybe about a 20-hour uh, trip. That was the most horrible thing again. We were marching, this camp is up on a hill. As we were marching up, people were beaten. I got one, one beat, I don't know why. People were shot. As we entered, there's a big, huge gate with the with this sign up on top. Arbeit max frei. Work will make you free. After all that walk of a few miles, the beatings and killings, we walked through the gate. There was a symphonic orchestra on the left side playing Beethoven. I remember that like it was yesterday. I, we didn't know what was going on. What is this, a resort place? The orchestra playing? They made us go around the circle or a large area, they brought out a large container. They dumped it on the ground, it's called Durga Muse. They used it as a soup that they fed the cows with. They said, okay, come and get it. Everybody was so hungry, everybody rushed on top of another with their hands to pick up from the dirty floor, pick up some whatever it was, the Durga Muse. I was watching it from my back, I never forget. But again, by that time we couldn't think. I was put in a barrack number six. Again, we were sleeping on a floor like sardines, one next to another. The guards and the couples were walking on top of us. Again, we didn't ask any questions. We couldn't. We were beaten for no reason at all. And when I arrived there, the kapo, you probably heard the expression kapo, they were in charge with the barracks. The Germans emptied all jails and sent them to concentration camps, and they became kapos. They were in charge with that barracks. We arrived to Mauthausen, barrack number six. The capo picked me out, says, come on. He takes me over to a small area where he slept. It was, it was, not, was not visible. He started touching me. Then I knew what he wanted. I rushed out of there. He had three people who held me down. 
and beat my back so bad for three days I couldn't get up. I never forget that. But he caught one kid that happened to be here in Cleveland. He ended up here. He caught him and he spent time with him. His life was changed. Mike Katz, K K A T Z. I was friends with him over here for a lot of years. He passed away a couple of years ago. His life was changed. No girlfriends, no wives, no nothing. That was a horrible thing that we, what he went through, and I saw it. I knew it. But again, Mauthausen, barrack number six, again. Am I going to work there? No. They put me on a train, they took me to... May I interrupt here just to get Go the ahead, timeline honey. a little bit? Go ahead. You said that the ghetto was about three weeks. You said your right. arrival in Auschwitz. If I could have approximate dates, just so we put right. it in some kind uh, of... Auschwitz, I arrived uh, beginning of May, like May 2nd. Okay. And you were there only six days? In May 8th. Uh-huh. And so your me. arrival in Mauthausen <clears throat> was around May 8th? Yes. Okay. And you were there for May how long? May 2nd. I left May 8th. Mm -hmm. But again, Mauthausen, it was an experience. People were killing, every day were killing uh, prisoners. They sent me to another place, a sub a Did, you, did they have you working in Mauthausen? No. Not at all? Not for a few days, no. Okay. Now, that was a major camp that had like 15 or 20 sub-camps. Mm -hmm. So I was sent to a sub-camp called Merk, M-E-R-K. It's a beautiful place. We didn't know what the heck we're doing, what we're going to do here. They have various jobs. And they sent me out to one place. I had to dig trenches. And while I was digging a trench one day, next to a guard tower, around lunchtime, a little package dropped down next to me. I didn't dare look up. I didn't know what was going to happen. If I pick it up, he'll shoot me. If I don't pick it up, he'll shoot me. I decided to pick it up. Took it behind the building. Opened it up, two pieces of bread and one slice of meat in between. He did that for four or five days. If he were being caught, he would have been shot. What did that do to me? Two things. Obviously, the food helped tremendously. But what was more important, that not everybody is a monster. There are human beings out there. He is a German, I don't know if he was Wehrmacht, us, SS, or whatever, but he risked his life to give this young kid his food. So that helped me tremendously to survive. And I worked there in Melk not very long, another month or so. What month are we talking? Most, We're talking about now. June. Okay. Then they send me again on a truck, an open truck. They had dead bodies in a truck laid out, I don't know, 15, 20 bodies. I had to sit on top of the bodies, the skeletons. They were not bodies anymore, skeletons. So we went to a place called Abense, which was not very far. We went to Abense. It was a group work camp. What month was that? Oh, uh, about June, end of June. Okay. Of 1944. Assigned me to a barrack. So we knew that's a work camp. Every morning at 6 o'clock, 6 to 8, we had to assemble, <coughs> excuse me, in front of the barracks for roll call. 
Well, in June or July, it wasn't bad. But when it came to December or January, it was 10 below zero. How did we survive? Standing there for two hours at the tension. If you moved, they beat you up. Some of, some of us were shot because they collapsed. They shot them. Every morning before we went to work, we had to stand out there. My assignment work was to work in a tunnel. They were uh, digging a tunnel to uh, make a factory out of it. Because this way, the bombs from the, uh, the enemies were not going to be effective. It was inside of a mountain. What kind of factories were they? What were they making? I have no idea because we were not there when they made the factory. We were just digging the factory. Huge tunnels we had to dig, which was the most horrible job. Go in the stones and break the stones piece by piece. Well, we had some food. In the morning, they gave us one cup of what they called coffee. It was black water. Lunchtime, one cup of soup. Again, the Durga music, what they fed the cows with. We drank that. In the evening, one piece of bread like that, that's all, nothing else. That was our food. Just recently here, they uh, looked it up because everything is uh, in the archives, 200 to 220 calories a day. Well, we went through each day as our last day. We could hardly walk anymore, and we had to work there. It was an unbelievable. Beatings were normal. We got used to it. Some people were shot. Now, and we heard that some people tried to escape. One day I worked outside, not in the tunnel. It's on a mountainside. When the guard comes over to me, the SS says, come with me. So he takes me up on top of that hill, says, go ahead, run away. I know he was going to shoot me. I says, no, I like it here. So I, didn't, I didn't go away. He would have shot me. So we did that one day at a time. But you know, Never dawned on me. Nobody talked about what happened to my family. Nobody talked about anything except one thing. Food. Survival. I never knew what survival was. You know, it reminds me um, when I see a squirrel in my backyard looking for food. That's the way we were. That's all we, we wanted. Nothing else but food. Nobody cared about their families. Nobody talked about... I, did I talk about my mother and my grandmother? And my, no. Did I think about them? No. But like I said before, we were brain dead. What does that mean? You're brain dead. You can't think. You think only one, one thing. Survive. What is survival? food. Of course we didn't know that. It was a horrible camp. We went through the winter standing outside for two hours with wooden shoes and I survived. And we were waiting but we never heard any news about the war, about the Allies. Not one word. Only one thing we heard in July, that Hitler was killed. That's when they tried to assassinate him. And the news came that he was killed. 
Everybody, oh God. Then came the bad news. They tried to kill him, but that didn't work. The bomb went off, but he was safe. So we went on living like this, day to day. People asked me if I had any friends there. No. Did I know some people there? Yes. Were we friends? No. You know, when we had that piece of bread in the evening, I just took one taste, just a couple bites, and I took it back on my bunk and put it behind my head to save it. But the next morning it was gone. Somebody stole it. Everybody was out for food. That's all we had. Nothing else. You know, when I think back, I remember every minute. But we survived until about three days before the end of the war. The camp commander assembled all the uh, inmates, 17,000 of us. They gave us a speech. Okay, the war is coming to an end, and I want to save your lives. Tell me when this was, please. Was in uh, May, uh, May, what, May 2nd, May 1st of 1945. And you were in Evans Day this whole time? Oh, yeah. Okay. So he said, I want you all to go into the tunnel, save your life. When the bomb will come, it will save your life. And I remember I was in the second row, 17,000 of us. And all the way to the right, we heard that before, there were some Russian POWs also. Then when the uh, commander made that speech, the word came down the line. No, in German, nine, nine. So we all said the same thing, no, no, no. We refused to go in a tunnel. We took a chance that all the guys going to come and shoot us. We're lucky. Nothing happened. He would have, he would have uh, blow up the uh, tunnel. And a lot of, a lot of concentration camps, they blow, blow up, blew up the uh, whole camp. Auschwitz was one of them. So we went through with that, but I knew by that time that I was, I was done. What was your condition at that point? I was dead. The only food I had is I picked up some grass. I ate some grass and I remember I found some worms. I picked it up and swallowed the worms. This is my last memory being there. I know I couldn't walk anymore. And the next thing I remember, a soldier, American soldier, picked me up. I was together. We got showed the pictures with all the bodies. I was there lying there. I don't know to this day how they selected me from the bodies, because I look like them. They picked me up, they fed me, I was in a barracks, but I got food, it was great. Then another guy and me, we said that we had enough, we watched all the cop was being killed on the streets, laying in blood. So this guy, also from Maradia, okay, let's get out of here. We had enough strength to walk. This was on the, uh, like a farmland. We walked to the first farm, asked for food. Well, they gave us a little milk. Just to be clear, this is still in Austria then? Austria, oh yeah. Of the oh camp. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we walked to the next farm. They looked at us and they put us in the barn they gave us some food. We didn't ask any questions. 
next day, they put us on the uh, horse and buggy cart. They wouldn't ask no questions. They took us to a uh, hospital nearby, not too far away, beautiful place. We spent three weeks there. They took our striped uniform. They gave us some normal clothes. They fed us. They treated us. We were revived. Who was with you for this? Uh, another guy from Oradia. His name was Imre. I-M-R-E. Imre. And I met him in, uh, in a camp. But they did all this, and they were Austrians, and they knew who we were, about the people in the uh, farm. They put us up. They did a great thing that I'm going to get to that. Um, tell me again your physical condition. You said you couldn't walk. Do you know what no. you do you know the, what you after weighed? After they fed me, mm -hmm. I could walk. I didn't even look at myself. Well, I was 65 pounds in the hospital when I was uh, taken to the hospital. 65 pounds. I'll show you some pictures here, right? And you were treated with compassion? I'm sorry? You oh, were treated yes. with compassion. Oh, yes. In the hospital? Oh, my God. What they was it like me. to go from one to the other, one extreme to the other? Again, our thinking was not, not 100%. If, even after liberation, we couldn't think right. But at least we were alive. They fed us medications and everything else. Disinfected. Well, we were full of lice. Head lice, body lice, typhus, every, 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 everything you can think of. And that hospital, they took care of us. It was great. Then this guy, Emre, and I, we decided, let's go back home. How are we going to get there? Well, the, the Austrian border was not very far from Budapest, Hungary. So we went on a train. We couldn't get inside of a train. It was so loaded with people. We went to the top of the train, lie down. We couldn't sit up because it would have fall. <coughs> Excuse me. So we uh, went for the train to Budapest. You say you rode on the top of the train? Oh yeah, top of the train lying down. You know, when I think about it, it's almost impossible. How can you? But you couldn't sit up because then you would fall. There's no room inside. So what are you supposed to do? So we went to Budapest, we took another train. This time we were inside went back to Oradia. How did you pay for that? Didn't pay. Nothing. We didn't have any money. We didn't have anything. I don't remember if they asked for it or what. I don't know. Went back to uh, Oradia. Got off the train. We knew where we were. Not too far. I went to my old house. Well, we lived with my mother, knocked on the door. There was an old lady who opened the door. said, what do you want? In Hungarian. I said, what do you mean what I want? That's my house. No, get out of here. She slammed the door on me. I said, what the heck am I, what am I going to do? But the Jewish organization, I don't know which one, highest or which one, they started working in the city. They put up a blackboard. They put up names that people that survived. They were on their way back. And about three days later, my mother's name appeared. Great. So by the way, I stayed with my aunt and uncle and my grandmother from Bucharest after the Romanians, they took over to Transylvania, they moved back there. So they took care of me. 
So my mother name, my mother's name appeared great. A week or two later, she came home. Where had she been? She was in uh, Bergen-Belsen. She how? worked. She worked in a factory in Bergen-Belsen. I was going to ask how she had survived. She survived. She was fifty years old. What was her skill? Nothing. No skill. I just gave her some job, and she worked. Mm -hmm. She survived. Then we reunited with my aunt, my grandmother, and her. Then one by one day, who shows up? My brother. Charlie. He's, he's Charlie. He survived the war camp for four years in Ukraine. Great, we got together, and we talked about what we're going to do here. I don't, you know, I remember I said, uh, I don't want to live here. This is all still during the first month? Yes. I don't want to, it's about three weeks later, I don't want to live here. So we decided and asked my mother, okay, let's, let's go to a deep, we heard about the DP camp, display person camp. Well, my mother said, no, I'm too old. You two take off and I'll stay here. Okay. So Charlie and I, we walked. We couldn't go through the irregular uh, uh, border, so we uh, went about five miles away to cross the border. We went to a small town in Hungary. We went to Budapest, and <clears throat> there was an organization that showed you how to cross the border to Austria. So we went to Austria. From there, we walked to Germany. From there, we went to a camp. I don't remember what was the name of it in Germany, a DP camp. We didn't like that. So we went to another DP camp, the same camp where my mother was, back in Belsen. But we lived in a building where the SS lived. It was great. It was under uh, British rule. So we have great, we had a good time. And one day I said to my brother, you know what, I'm going to go to Israel. Well, prior to that, did you have a job in the DP camp? Well, I was going to tell you that. Okay. My brother was a police chief, and I was his assistant policeman. I know about it as much as you do. <laughs> but again, there were a lot of... Uh, DPs there, and we had to take care of them, make sure that everything is okay. So one day I said, I'm going to Israel. He was so angry at me, he turned the table on me. You're not going to Israel. And all his life he was a Zionist. Okay. Then we decided to leave the DP camp. So we went to Frankfurt, Germany. After how much time in the DP camp? Oh, not very long. Forty-five, May. Oh, he got married there, by the way, in a DP camp. Well, we stayed there for about three, four months. In October. We moved to uh, Frankfurt, Germany. Which everything was fine. Then the uh, Jewish organization, I think it was highest. Sign me up. Where do you want to go? The United States. That's great. He signed me up. A week later, come on, we'll take you to uh, the, uh, what is that, Burns? What is that called where the uh, ship were, ships were? They put me on a ship, come to the United States. Why was that expedited? That was very quick to be able to get out. Why? Because Truman, President Truman, allowed children under 20 to enter this country. And you were how old? 19. But I lied. I said I'm 18. Instead of 26, I said 27. For your birth year? Yeah. yeah. So I came to the United States. 
That would have been okay at the 26 also. Came to the United States. <clears throat> we arrived in New York. The organization was with us all the way. Arrived in New York. Do you remember the date of that? Uh, good question. I got it on a paper here. Okay. We arrived here and they put us on a bus. Where are we going? Nobody had, had any answers. They drove us with the bus to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I only one guy that I knew. Three guys, three of us. They put up with put us up with the family, the Jewish family took us in. And we didn't speak one word of English, not one word. They sent me to a school during the day and worked in a factory at night. I learned how to speak English, sort of. But I worked at night and I uh, was thinking about only one thing. Here I was like a homeless person, really and truly. I had no home, no, nothing. And it's a country that adopted me. I owe him something. Well, let's get back to that because ahead, the honey. United States took you in. Yes. And you had had a history of being in a country that didn't recognize you as a citizen. What right. did it mean to come to the United States? It didn't mean anything. I don't know what the uh, Jewish organization, <clears throat> how did they do it, but President Truman set this up, allowing children to come to the United States without any background, zero background, visa, nothing. It was an unbelievable thing. If you read up on it, you can read up on it. Tens of thousands of children were allowed to come to this country. I was one of them. So we worked there and about two months later, I said to my friend that I was with, okay, let's get out of here, that's too much. I work at night to go to school. But let me go to a recruiting station in Milwaukee. So I went to a recruiting station Okay. For the I military. For the military. Yes. Because the Korean War was brewing. So I had to take a test. To pass was 75 points. I went 65. Nope. Can't do it. I says, okay. Okay, Bill. Let's go to New York. Took the train. Come to New York. The Jewish organization took care of us there. Put us up in an apartment. Again, I went to a recruiting station. Oh, I did 70. No go. I went to another one two weeks later. 76. Okay. They accepted me in the Army. And it's, when was that? Oh, God. In 1946. June, June 1946. They sent me to Fort Dix, New Jersey for basic training. It was great. Everything went well. So the captain said, okay, this group, you guys going overseas. He says, good, we're going to Korea. No. So where are we going? We're going to Germany. Where? Frankfurt. We got on a ship. i never forget that. We arrived in Frankfurt. Okay, now what? Okay, you're going to be assigned to this organization called ECIC, European Command Intelligence Center. Next is a suburb of Frankfurt. Okay, so they took us there. I was mean, given a job to work at the uh, security section. Then Major Gardner, who was in charge, comes over. He says, you, they picked me. You went to school. What school? Military Police Intelligence School. Oh, God. Where? 
over Ramagau, close to where Hitler lived. So I went there, I went to school. You've seen the certificates from the school, remember I showed it to you? I passed. I went back. I was assigned to an organization, or to a, a section, security section, which was great. I did a lot of, a uh, lot of things. I loved it. I told you, I don't know if I told you one day, Major Garner says, you and two of your buddies, by that time I was promoted already. Yeah, what was your rank? Staff Sergeant. Staff Sergeant. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I told you, but uh, I got an assignment for you guys. Okay? Three of you, they, they, you take four Russian prisoners, exchange them with four, four American prisoners. Okay? We took the train to Berlin. We were told exactly where to go. The Brandenburg Bridge, the huge bridge. All three of us, we carried our machine guns like this. We went to the center. There comes the Russians, also with machine guns. We exchanged the prisoners, but we didn't turn our backs. Neither did the Russians. We were backing up. So we did the right exchange. This one I can come up with. But I was undercover in a lot of, lot of places, which was great. I served there for four years. Put that period into perspective for us, if you would. Because after World War II, the alliances changed. Yes. And so the United States had new interests in Europe and what was happening with, this, with Russia. Would you talk about that for a minute? Okay. I was with the intelligence. And I would have known because I was with that unit. Did we care about the Germans, prisoners? There were SS, Gestapo. I had to work hand in hand sometimes with the German police. Did we care who they were? They were SS and Gestapo. We didn't care about that because we were, we were with the Russians at Cold War. That's all we were concerned about. And I tell you about uh, Dr. Fisher. But that was our assignment and I had undercover assignments and which was fine. But again, only the Russians, not the Germans. That Hun was your interest, yeah. Hundreds um, of thousands of Germans. They were killers. They were released. Yeah. In a camp there, uh, the later on was called Camp King. It was a German doctor that took care of the personnel. His name was Dr. Fischer. He was a great guy, about 50, 55 years old. I saw him two or three times a week. I took prisoners to him to examine and all that. And we were talking. Then one day he said, uh, I'm going to say goodbye to you. And we spoke German, by the way. My daughter is marrying an American officer, so I'm going to the United States. I wished him well. Six months later we found out that uh, there was a reporter here, Drew Pearson found out who he was. He was the Surgeon General of the German Army. At one point in Nuremberg, he testified against uh, one of the big shots, Goering. He testified against Goering. However, he was also in charge with one of the camps after the war. And uh, then it came out that during the war, he was in charge with this camp. They were experimenting with people, various experiments. One of them, freezing people to death. You read about that? Freezing people to death. 
So when Drew Pearson came up with the story about this guy, but well, we knew all about, all about his uh, background, you know, they sent him to Argentina. That's it, we're a private plane. But we had also 1,800 other scientists from Germans. So they are the Russians. We used them with their knowledge against the Russians. Same thing. And his name was not Fisher, it was Walter Schreiber. And, you know, I met him every, every two or three days, and he was a nice guy. Walter Schreiber. He passed away in 1976. And where was he when he died? I'm sorry? Where was he when in, he died? In uh, Argentina, of course. Mm -hmm. But when I was in uh, my outfit, we heard that he was sent back to Germany and he got five years. That's a lie, of course. Because we're hiding these people, we use them. 1,800 of them. I have an article on that. My daughter Lisa found out all about these people. It's terrible. But again, we needed them against the Russians during the Cold War. And the Russians did exactly the same thing. Oh, by the way, as Dr. Uh, Schreiber, after the war, he was captured by the uh, Russians and spent two years in jail there. They never raised him. But again, it was a hell of a good experience being there and serving my country. Four years was great. And which four years were they? What were the years of your service? What year? 1948 to 1952. Okay. I came back and my uh, name was there in the army, Zoli. Zoltan. I came back. The second day I was in New York, I went up to the, uh, uh, I don't know, what do they call it? Where do they naturalize you? It's, well, anyways, I went, I went up there. And uh, the judge, I went before the judge. He said, okay, let's see, Zoltan Burnett. I was in uniform. He said, okay, he signed off. No test, no nothing. He said, okay, you're naturalized. I said, but I want to change my name. Okay, so he gave me the paper. What do you want? Stanley. Okay. How'd you pick Stanley? I have no idea. I think originally I want to see. I swear to God, I want to see. But somehow I end up with Stanley. <laughs> but he never tested me because for naturalization you have to take a test. But I was in full uniform, of course. But uh, it was a great experience. But again, the important thing is what I tell the kids when I give these lectures. I've been doing it for 40 years, talking about the Holocaust. Why? What's important about the Holocaust? should never, ever be forgotten. That should never happen again. What happened a couple of months ago in Syria? A hundred people were gassed. The whole world was in uproar. Here we're talking about millions of people, Jews and non-Jews, were killed. 1.2 million children were gassed and burned to death. It's in the archives that uh, some babies were not even gassed. They were put in the ovens in Auschwitz alive. The Germans kept a record of everything. They had billions of records. That's how Lisa got all the information for me. What I'd like to do now, if it's all right, is take a little break. Okay. And when we come back, we'll talk about your life after you were discharged oh. from the military. I don't know. Thank I'm you. here. <laughs> we're back from our little break and when before we stopped we were talking about that time after you were discharged from the military and starting your life over again um, once we were back um, here what, what kind of opportunities were available to you? when I was discharged from the army yes, you left Milwaukee, came to New York what was available to you? 
Well, the only thing I could find is uh, I was a race car driver. Could you define that? I was driving a taxi cab in New York. <laughs> and that was like uh, driving a race car. But everything was fine and uh, somebody introduced me to Arlene that later became my wife. What was Arlene's name when you met her? Weiner. W-E-I-N-E-R. Weiner. Yeah, we met and uh, we started dating here and there. Then I uh, decided to go in the Army, so I said goodbye to her. I have not heard or talked to her or on the phone or anything for four years. When I came back, I got discharged and I got uh, several jobs. One job was uh, I got in a hotel in the Catskills, the Browns Hotel. I was a head waiter there. And I took one of the girls, one of the waitresses, to go into another hotel. There's something going on there. So we went there, and uh, there were dan people dancing. And who would I see there dancing? My wife, Arlene. She was dancing. So I went there. Hi. I haven't talked to her in four years. <gasps> oh, my God. From that point on, we started dating. And uh, everything worked out okay. Do you remember the date that you met? Or we met? Okay. Uh, what was the date? Four. In 1952, when I got discharged from the Army. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What town or what, what place was she from? She was from a small town in Hungary. Kishvarda. Mm -hmm. It's a very small town. Had, was she a su survivor also? Yeah, she was in Dachau. Oh, I remember what I was going to tell you. I volunteer over at Menorah Park every day. And a couple of years ago, uh, the uh, head nurse says to me, I want you to meet somebody. Okay. Takes me into one of the uh, rooms one of the residents there said, I want you to meet uh, Dr. Silver. Okay. Dr. Silver, I want you to meet Stanley Burnett. He's a survivor of a concentration camp. And I want you to meet Dr. Silver. He was a uh, liberator of Dachau concentration camp. He started crying, started hugging me, he has not talked about it for 68 years. He couldn't talk about it. What he saw there, the dead bodies, skeletons, he couldn't talk about it. From that point on, every time I had a presentation, he came with me. We went to Beechwood High, 200 people were there. He started talking, and he was shaking like a leaf. He couldn't talk about it. So I asked him, look, I have a video that I show usually. I don't know if you want to see it. He said, why? It's from the same camp that you liberated. And one of the soldiers must be you. He said, okay. So from that point on, I always showed a video. He couldn't recognize himself, but he was one of the first soldiers who entered Dhaka. Can you believe that? He passed away about a year and a half ago. That, that was so interesting to meet somebody, uh, but he couldn't talk about it. Like so many people. Yes. Um, talk about your courtship, because that represented the beginning of new life for you, I would think. Well, the courtship was when I met uh, with Arlene up at the Catskills. Then we started dating. We played some tennis, and uh, I uh, lived temporarily with my brother on uh, 337 East 13th Street. He lived on the fifth floor. So I decided with Arlene, why don't we get married? That was in March of 19... 
53. And you started a family fairly soon after? Right after, in September. And we moved into the same apartment where my brother lived. Well, tell me what happened in 1953 in September. This when Vera and Lisa were born. And this when the uh, OBGYN called me in to talk to me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he called me in, the OBGYN called me in. I want to talk to you. I said, okay. I want to tell you something. You're going to have twins. This when I had my first heart attack. <laughs> I couldn't afford one. I'm going to have two now. But it was the greatest thing. We raised them in New York. Then we moved to Cleveland. When, when was that? When moved? they were about uh, two years old. Yeah. And what was, what was in Cleveland for you? Well, there was nothing, really. My uh, brother-in-law, he was a heating air conditioning man, said, why don't you move here? I said, okay. So we moved here. He says uh, to me, why did you move here for? There's nothing here available. I said, okay, I made it. Okay, we rented a, an apartment. We got our furniture in here, and I was looking for a job, and I found a job at uh, Republic Steel. What did you do? I started as an electrician, then uh, a foreman. They sent me to school again. I needed more school. And it was great until I decided that I want to go into business for myself. I went to the City Hall, Cleveland, uh, took the test. I passed. I was a contractor, so I told my boss at uh, Republic Steel, I'm leaving. He says, no, you're not. I says, I got my own business. He said, I'm going to make you a, a, a manager of this whole area. He says, I don't care what. So I went into business for myself. Electrical contractor. And that wasn't easy, but it was okay. I got started. What did you call yourself? Uh, that was Stanley Electric. Stanley Electric. I still have some brochures on it. It was a long time ago. And everything was fine. I did okay. I knew all the uh, uh, inspectors in Cleveland. I got jobs all over the place from them until I went to see one of the contractors that I bid on a small job. He says, I'm sorry to tell you, but you were five, foot, five cents too high than the next guy. I said, what? I said, okay, I had enough. I went up to uh, HUD, HUD the department here. They gave me an appointment. I says, well, what I'd like to do is work for you guys as a general contractor. Said, okay, we need general contractors. Took out my license, and I started working for HUD. All over the place. It was great. And that's how it started in the big business. Then... We started working for uh, CMHA. Oh my God. Cleveland Metropolitan Housing, Housing Authority. Housing Authority, mm -hmm. right. We installed about 25,000 windows. We, we did a hell of a job. And I had my office in uh, Maple Heights. And one of my, uh, I bought that building. One of my tenants' daughter says to one day, you're a general contractor, and you have to buy windows. Why don't you manufacture your own windows? I says, well, okay. It happened to be a show in Florida, a window show. So I went there with my son-in-law and met this guy that was manufacturing the material for windows. He talked me into getting into the business. I says, what will it take? Oh, about $75,000. So, yeah, it's not too bad. I looked for a building. 
I found one that I liked in Walton Hills. So the real estate guy said, you don't want this building. I said, why? He says, it's a piece of junk. I looked inside, it was horrible. I said, okay, I'll take it. We have to get it within 10 days, and we got it. I had to remodel the whole building. And we start making windows. Let and me guess, the name of the company. Stanley Windows. What else? <laughs> I called my son-in-law. He was running the uh, factory. How many windows did you do? Eight. A week later, how many? Fifteen. Oh, my God. I said, oh, my God. We end up with 25,000 a year windows. I just hated every time he said, I want to talk to you. I said, why? <laughs> I need 50,000 more. Instead of 75,000 investment, I had three quarters of a million dollar investment. But it worked out great. It was a good business. We did 25, 30,000 windows a year with 65 employees on the line, and no computers. Four o'clock every morning, him and I, we go to the office and assign by hand all the windows on the, on the line. Today, 10 minutes, computers, we didn't have it. But it worked out okay. I was very friendly with the uh, director of HUD, so one day he says to me, uh, why don't you sell your business, the window company? He says, George, everything is for sale if the price is right. Yes. A week later he calls me, I want you to meet somebody downtown. Okay. I go with him. I want, I want you to meet Virtual, the biggest builder downtown. Okay, so I went there to meet Virgil. He's the busiest man you have ever seen in your life. He said, okay, how much you want for a business and all that? So I told him. He said, okay, I'll call you. I said, what? Waste my time. Two weeks later, I get a call. I got a buyer. What? So we went to meet the new prospective buyer. Give him a price. Okay. We went to uh, his attorney's office, six attorneys around the table. I have one little guy. Signed all the papers. He says, uh, just before we signed, you made a mistake. I said, what? You had a job, $350,000 job with CMHA. You didn't put them on your contract. I add that on the price. I couldn't believe it. So I sold the company to him. Mm -hmm. Did you stay in the construction business? Oh, yes. Right there and then, we went into large construction. We're talking about, we just finished a job in Brunswick, $1.2 million job. Sounds like you're still working. Yeah. Well, I get the jobs, and my son always is my former, and he runs the job. You yeah. know you're 91, right? <laughs> well, I don't know. Not really, because I died May 5th, 1945, and I was liberated May 6th. I was reborn. So I used that as my birthday, second day birthday. That's beautiful. Really? Yeah. I don't feel any older than I was 20 years ago. Well, you've made very good use of your time from everything I understand. What what do you do to stay busy and stay involved in the community? Okay. Um, you, you did mention already right. the fact Number that you one, talks. I volunteer at Menorah Park for nine and a half years, seven days a week, from two to five, three to five, I'm sorry, three to five every day. What's your What's your job description? My job description is visiting patients, 85 patients a day. Tell them how beautiful they are. I know their names. They want to kiss me. They love it. 
Then I volunteered over at uh, Jewish Family Service Association, GFSA, delivering Meals on Wheels. I visit Holocaust survivors, provide, uh, like uh, Ava, she just called me. I provide transportation to the doctor, to shopping. I try to help other people as much as I can. The greatest thing I have ever done is volunteering. It's unbelievable how gratifying that thing is, to be able to help others. And not many people can do it. Right. I know I try to talk my daughter into it to visit the, uh, then she can do it. Because well, these people that I visit, and I also uh, do hospice work. So it's not an easy thing to do, but I'm so used to it. Nine and a half years, it seemed like yesterday. Mm -hmm. When did you start talking about your personal story? What prompted you to start speaking? You said you've been doing about it for about forty how long? years ago. How many? Forty. Forty. Forty years ago. Well, that was early to speak about it. Yeah, my uh, yeah, we didn't speak about it for twenty-five years after what, twenty-five, thirty years. I told my daughters Vera and Lisa that I was in a concentration camp, and that's it. Didn't talk about it. What is that to talk about? Until my niece went to Heights High, and she asked me one day, "Why don't you come and talk about the Holocaust?" Okay. She was taking a class, and they had that class. And from that point on, I'm getting it all the time, all over. And I love to talk about it because it's important not to forget. Not to forget what happened. That should never happen again. We're talking about six million Jews and five million or six million non-Jews. And if I tell you in a camp next to me, in uh, Avensee, on a shelf, was a uh, Catholic priest. He was about 55 years old from Hungary. We were talking, he said. He had gangrene on his leg. He said, you know what? I dedicated my life to God. I'm done. Next day he was dead. What he saw there, he didn't believe anymore. They went both ways in the camp. There were some atheists before became believers. They had to believe in something. Then they were really orthodox Jews, didn't believe anymore what they saw there. How did your own religious views in your own spiritual life evolve over time? No, it didn't. You know. I uh, I thought about it. Why did God allow this to happen? But again, there is an explanation. God did not do this. God gave us the willpower to do whatever we want to do, human beings. If you go back 3,500 years, people were killing people, brother against brother. King David, his son kicked him out of there. He took over the throne. And we're talking about 3,500 years ago. Why should this be different? The important thing is we should not allow this to happen again. It, it, it's just a terrible 1.2 million children. You know, uh, I volunteer also and I uh, and provide the money uh, at Menorah Park. Every year, the uh, new uh, staff members take him with a bus to uh, Washington, D.C. to visit the museum. And we went there two years ago. I went with them. It's a beautiful place. Oh, my God. It shows all the places, my house and everything. It doesn't bother me. Then we go downstairs. His section is a children's section. When I went in there, I couldn't take it. 1.2 million children gassed 
and burned to death. How can, can, can anybody even imagine that this could happen? Today, if it happens to 100 people or guests, we are all upset about it. 1.2 million children guests. It's hard to believe. Have you made trips back? Yes. To Hungary, Romania? Oh, I make trips all over the place. Talk about that a bit. Okay, I'll tell you about a more interesting trip. I took a trip with Lisa, my daughter. We went to Mauthausen about four years ago. Mauthausen is about 95% intact, same as it was before. There was a special occasion commemoration. 10,000 people attended. We couldn't get a hotel only 40 miles away. 40,000 people, uh, 4,000 people, 10,000 people attended. United States, we had the diplomats, the army, navy, marines. It was a fabulous thing to do. 26 countries were represented. Can you imagine that? 26 countries that lost their people in Mount Hazen. They have monuments in 26 countries. Can you believe that? So I went there and um, I said to Lisa, my daughter, come on, let's go into the crematorium and the gas chamber, let me show it to you. Oh, she said, no, I can't, I can't do that. So, okay, huh? I went, doesn't bother me came out. She says, okay, I'll go in now. So she came in with me. She says, okay, hon, let me show you something. Come to barrack number six. I'll show it to you. This is why I was sleeping on the floor right there. Can you believe that? So many years ago, I remember I slept right there on the floor. Did it bother me? No. You know how many survivors were there? Three. That's From that all. gathering of 10,000 people? Yeah, three survivors in a wheelchair. I marched with the uh, American diplomats and Army Navy, of course. It was a great, great thing. 10,000 people. 26 countries lost people there. Can you believe that? And we're talking about the Holocaust, the Jews. It's not only Jews. Millions of non-Jews. So, this is why we should not allow this to happen again and not to forget. Yeah. We, we can't. Have you been back to Aradia, your oh, hometown? Oh yes, almost every year I go back there. Why? Because I want to go to the cemetery. Okay, I have to tell you about this one. My mother married an old friend of ours, an old dentist, while we were gone. And uh, we financed her to go to Israel in the 60s. And we went to Israel. Then we brought her here, of course. To Cleveland. To Cleveland. Mm -hmm. She lived with us for one year. Then we put her up in an apartment on uh, South Taylor. Everything was fine. Then one day... Uh, her husband died, and he was in a camp with me, the one I showed you the book. This is the guy that she married, the one that wrote that book. So one day uh, she says, you know what, I'd like to go back to Oradia. There's a spa there, a very good spa. I said, okay, I allowed her to go by herself. She speak one language except Hungarian. How did I allow her to do it? I don't know. What bought all the tickets and everything. Well, she went there. And she went to the spa. And my stepbrother lives in Cluj, which is not too far, but 50, 60 miles away. He was a doctor and his wife was a doctor. And uh, my mother went there to visit. And she, while she was visiting, she had a heart attack. And she died right there in front of him. It's unbelievable thing. 
So they took her back to Aradia and they put her together with the whole family there. My father, two grandmothers, a brother. Can you believe that? And she is there. That's why I like to go back every year to go to the cemetery to see them. The community then, in the early 1940s, was about how many people, the Jewish community? 35,000. And today? 600. I thought it was 260, but I just read an article it was 600. So we go there. There are two temples, the Orthodox, and they call it the Neolog, which was the conservative temple, totally rebuilt, like brand new. Who paid for it? The city or the, uh, the government paid for it. It's beautiful, fabulous. The second one, I think, is all done. So we may go there this, this year. Every year I like to go there. I go back to my old house when I was a kid. We go in there the same as it was when I lived there. An old lady lives there. We walk, they walk in and take pictures. It's great. Oh, I think I'd like to finish with family. And okay. um, you said you have twin daughters. Yes. Talk about them a little bit. And then tell me what it was like, what you were like as a dad. Okay. Twin daughters. Well, when they were born in New York, uh, I saw them as much as I could, but not a lot because I was too busy working. I was driving a taxi cab and also I was an electrician. I had to make money again. So, but I saw them enough. They were good friends. I loved them. We moved to Cleveland. Of course, I had more time with them. Beautiful kids. And uh, after we uh, rented here in Cleveland, we uh, bought a house on the GI Bill in, Wick in Willowick. $17,000, a brand new house. Except for one thing, I didn't have $500 to put down. So I had to ask my wife's brother-in-law in New York to loan me $500. <laughs> of course, a month later I paid him back. But we had a good life. They went to school there in Willowick. They were good kids. We spent a lot of time together. Except, and Vera will remember that, when we bought the new house, in their bedroom, they were going up and down the bedroom with crayons on the wall. When I saw that, I almost died. A brand new house. But you ask her, she remembers. But we had a good time. I spent a lot of time with them. And uh, everything was fine. Then we bought houses here in Cleveland, the Cleveland Heights, the University Heights, were all over the place. They were good kids, and they went to Kent State, both of them. They graduated. We always have a good relationship with them. Vera, I talk to twice a day. She calls me twice a day, checking on me. But I told her it works both ways. You check on me, I'll check on you that you're okay. Lisa I talk to once a day. It's a great. And the uh, grandkids, Vera has a boy and a girl. Their names? It's Sean and Leah. One is in Columbus, and Leah moved, uh, got a new job in Utah, northern Utah, in the university. And uh, Lisa has one son in L.A., 26 years old, Adam. Adam. Good kid. I just talked to him yesterday. Mm -hmm. Good kid. What would, your, what would you say your grandchildren have learned from you? Respect. Respect each other. 
we have done that all our lives with the kids. Mm -hmm. Did I ever beat him up? Lisa said yes one time. I said when? When they were going with the crayon. <laughs> when they were three years old, pet, pet me in the tokas. I don't remember that. <laughs> I would never touch him. No, we had a good relationship as kids and uh, we still have a good relationship now mm -hmm. because this is what life is about. There family, are no, yeah, family. Exactly. There are no great-grandchildren yet. No. 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 Uh, but this is something that they will see. What would you want to tell your great-grandchildren? What? I would tell them about my experiences, but they would be too young to tell them about that. I would tell them to respect your parents and grandparents, your family, because nothing in the world is better than family. Yeah. You can't get any closer to anybody than family, and I see it every day. We're children and families are so far apart. Yeah. Is that life? No. You talk to thousands of strangers every year with the yes. presentations that you do. Yeah. What message do you leave with them? Well, number one is respect. Respect everybody. No hatred. That's the big, biggest thing. No hatred. Because kids ask me, don't you hate the Germans? I says, no. I says, I'll give you an example. Before the war, how many Germans were there? 80 million. Out of 80 million, how many were SS Gestapo killers? 5 million? 10 million. How many followers? 20 million. How about the other 40 million? I just read a book on survivors in Germany. None Nazis. How they survived, what they went through. Hunger and everything else. So it wasn't easy, so you can't generalize. So I try to teach the kids, don't generalize. Every German was bad? No. Hatred? No, I never hated anybody in my life. I don't like somebody? Just get away from it. But don't hate. That is, you know, hatred is like a weight on your shoulder. You cannot accept. This is what happened in Germany, the hatred. Hate the Jews. We can't have that. Respect each other. You know what I ask the kids? How many gods are there? And I have a hundred kids. One finger goes up. I say, okay. It doesn't matter how you pray to that God. There's one God. And we keep on saying God. What difference does it make? If you're a Jew or a Christian or a Muslim, what? it's one God. So... That's what I try to teach him. Respect each other, be nice to people, and uh, don't hate. That's important. We're going to come back after a pause and look at some of the pictures that you would like to show on the tape. Oh, Is there okay. anything that I haven't asked you that you would like to fill in? Mm. Yes. You didn't ask me, how come I don't feel like 91? I how? feel like 98. <laughs> Some days, no. You know what? It has to do with attitude. You know, Vera was telling me just yesterday, he went, went to North Carolina to a party, whatever, and everybody was talking about their parents, the father, the mother, terrible sickness and all that. So she says... Uh, Look at you. <laughs> I don't want to be like them. I don't want anybody to take care of me. I'll take care of myself. I do everything in my house. Some people ask me, how come you, you, you don't have a lawnmower company? I'll take care of my own grass. What do I need a lawnmower for? I have a tractor and I have a hand mower. So, what's the big deal? I do as much as I can by myself. 
Well, I know you have a loving, lot of loving support. Vera will speak in a couple of minutes. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of support. They're giving back what they got as yeah. children. Yeah. Well, because I'm, you get back. It goes around. What goes around comes around. Right. Well, I will say thank you very much. I thank you. All right. Because really, really and truly, I love to talk about it, of my experiences, which is a horrible experience. When I think about it, I don't, I never lost any sleep over it. I have a friend in California, a couple of years ago, I went there visiting with Lisa, and we were talking about this guy, and all of a sudden I sent him, I uh, mentioned the word Holocaust. <gasps> Oh my God, I won't be able to sleep tonight. How can you live like that? Then Hitler would have won. No, he didn't. He died at 56. And we're here. But he can't. He can't even think about it. Well, just like uh, Dr. Uh, Silver. Couldn't talk about it for 86, 88 years. He couldn't. And some people are like that. Nope, get him out of your system and share it with other people. That's the important thing. Thank you very much. I thank you. You guys were great. I don't know about Steve, but uh, no, he's okay. Uh, tell me about this picture. Who is in it? It's my father. And I probably got it from my aunt or my brother mm -hmm. when he passed away. And what uniform is he wearing? It's a Hungarian army uniform, uh, First World War. Thank you. You're ready. And tell me who's in this picture. Myself, Stanley Burnett. I'm probably four or five years old. Any idea where this picture came from? No, not clue. I think it's from my parents. Thank you. Thank you. Will you tell me about this picture? You ready? Yes. Yeah, this is my mother, my father, my brother, and my grandmother. And when was it taken? Well, I was probably about 10 years old. And where was the location? Was it inside your home? Uh, inside my home in Oradia. Thank you. Thank you. Please tell me about this picture. Yeah, it's a high school picture. I'm on the right, and my... Uh, Friend George is on the left. We're good friends. Do you know the approximate year? I was probably about uh, 11, 12 years old. Thank you. Thank you. Still moving a little. Who's in this picture? My wife, Arlene, <clears throat> was taken in 1948 before I uh, went in the Army. This and, is when I first met her. And her name was what then? Arlene. Last name? Ber oh, Arlene Weiner, W-E-I-N-E-R. Thank you. You're welcome. Who's in this picture? Yes, myself and my beautiful wife, Arlene. A uh, picture taken before I went overseas in 1948. And this picture? That's my family, my immediate family. My two daughters, Lisa and Vera, and my beautiful wife, Arlene. Picture taken in 1972, approximately. And this? Tell me who's in this picture. Oh, I see. Yes, I'm my two beautiful twin daughters. Uh, approximately 2012 taken. And which is which? Oh, the one on the left is Vera, the one on the right is Lisa. And finally, who is in this picture? My beautiful wife Arlene and my three, three grandchildren, Leah, Sean, and Adam. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is uh, my beautiful daughter, Vera, one of the uh, two daughters I have, twin daughters. 
Besides being beautiful, she is a beautiful person. I loved her all her life. She makes my life worthwhile. That's what life is about. And I couldn't ask for any better daughters than she is. Well, thank you, Dad. Um, it's difficult for me to talk without getting emotional, so I'm going to do the best that I can. My sister and I grew up um, wanting for nothing. Um, my dad did everything that he possibly could, working 18 hours a day to <laughs> support my sister and I and my mom. And he, he of course, did a tremendous job, as, as my mom did as well. Um, I remember our childhood that my parents were both pretty strict. They, they were more concerned about our health and our well-being than anything. Um, overprotective, but we now know why. And we didn't really understand it until uh, when my sister and I were 23 years old and we went back to where my parents were born and raised. And we also went to one of the concentration camps that my father was in. And then did we truly understand why um, they were both so overprotective. My mother's parents were killed in Auschwitz. Um, my father, thank God, survived, you know, with his mother, which was, I mean, a godsend. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. So for us, once we understood the severity about what happened and we knew where he was and he would go through all the steps when we were walking through Mauthausen, did we truly realize that there was a reason why um, he was so protective of us. And even to this day, you know, the most important thing to him is his family. So, you know, it's myself, my sister, and our families and our, you know, our kids, of course. So. Thank you, sweetheart. You make me emotional also. But you know, for years, especially your sister, Lisa, she didn't like the idea of being, me being overprotective. That's for sure. But you know what? I could never survive if anything happened to you guys. Without you guys, there would be no life for me. This is why I was overprotective. And thank God that I was. And Lisa recognizes the fact also. And you too, darling. I'm lucky to have beautiful family, beautiful children and grandchildren. And as we said before, life is about family. Without it, we have nothing. So I'm lucky to have you, darling. Oh, she kissed me. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, they are terrific kids, really and truly. They care about uh, the old man like I care about them. I want to make sure every time they call me to see how I am, I want to make sure that they are okay. Because my life is about their well-being. That's the important thing. And so far, I'm lucky. So we'll see. Next 10, 20 years, and then we'll see what. Okay, darling.